Hi everyone. Well, as promised, I have a very special guest on our show, the inventor of the Nectar Defender, Dennis Jenkins here. Dennis, hi there. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? How are things in California? It's sunny and warm today. <laughs> uh, well, it's summertime here, so it's beautiful as well. And you know what? Hummingbirds are slowly starting to come back. So this is perfect timing to talk about your wonderful product for hummingbirds. So I'm not going to waste too much of your time. Let's just jump into it. Please tell us a little bit about your background so we know what actually brought you into this whole birding business. Well, I've, uh, I've spent most of my adult life developing safe and effective products for animals. I have about 10 patents related to animal products and animal health. Uh, your listeners may be interested to know that for 20 years, I was one of the lead inventors behind uh, a product they probably used. Uh, uh, I helped develop premium cat litters like Fresh Step, Scoop Away, Everclean, all under the Clorox company. And uh, I have graduate training in chemistry and geology, and I love cats, so it was a good fit. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> from- and, as part of that, and as part of that, worked for those 20 years partnering with veterinarians and universities on animal health. And so that's that was kind of my career. But when I left the Clorox company, I started my own company focusing on solving the major problems in wild bird feeding. Oh. So, uh, and... Some there, from I cats started. To birds. Yeah, from cats to birds. That's right. <laughs> um, and I had a couple of products that are feeder type products uh, where I ended up uh, getting to know the Wild Birds Unlimited uh, franchise company and went to their trade shows. And I would ask them what their biggest problem was. And, <laughs> and because with my background in product development, I might be able to solve them. And sure enough, uh, one of the biggest problems they had when we were starting was uh, caking and molding in seed feeders. And the uh, I worked on that problem and came up with a product called Feeder Fresh that keeps the seed in the feeders dry and, mm-hmm. and they don't uh, cake and mold. I <laughs> so, know. I use it all the time, especially with Niger seed. I find it works really nice. That's right. Especially yes. with Niger, especially to tube feeders yeah and uh that um and that product led to other products i, I come back to them uh, the next year and say okay what's your next big, biggest problem and i'd work on that <laughs> and so uh-huh. eventually and eventually that led to we have you know can you do in hummingbird feeders what you did in seed feeders can you make it so that they last longer but without a preservative, <laughs> without uh, you know an artificial preservative that they normally put in nectar, and so that um, led us to start working on solving that problem, which is a tough problem. How do you do a how do you preserve nectar without mm-hmm. a preservative? And That's right. So how long uh, did it take you to come up with that? That sounds so elaborate. Yeah. <laughs> it, it actually took a couple of years because I wanted to make sure it was inherently safe and natural. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, Rather than looking, you know, for what was a preservative, I started the other way, and I looked at components that hummingbirds actually need and they consume in nature. Mm-hmm. And that, um, as I looked through those components, found one of them that did a very good job in preserving the nectar in that particular system, and that was a micronutrient copper, which they need. All animals need it at a very low level. You need it birds need it. And so that was one of the things that worked very effectively and also uh, very safe. It doesn't accumulate in the system. It doesn't, uh, it, it's something that they need. And we found surprisingly that uh, a very trace level of copper in the nectar does a great job in that environment of keeping uh, the nectar fresh. And that. You know, that's kind of the, the track <laughs> to, to get there. Cornell absolutely approved your product. You know, what what did you have to go through to get that kind of approval? Well, we went, um, rather than going through their, you know, the marketing office, we went directly to the veterinarians, mm-hmm. uh, scientists at Cornell. Uh-huh. And I uh, hooked up with uh, 
a one of the scientists that was an a veterinarian, but an expert in uh, metals and metal in the diet and metal toxicity. Just to, you know, have the person who's the expert because we were adding in copper. I wanted to make sure that it was somebody who would be uh, an authority on that and make sure it was safe and effective. So we had information that we gave to them and they were able to approve it. And knowing what animals need and knowing the levels we're using a very, very to trace level that that was safe. In fact, I think the best way to state this is that um, hummingbirds need a certain, there's research been done on what hummingbirds need as far as a level of copper. And uh, we actually, our product is actually below that level. <laughs> so we, not only is it something they need, but we're, we're, it's in our product a level below the level that is actually kind of their minimum daily requirement. Uh -huh. So that's the, that's why it's inherently safe is it's actually something they need and actually at a lower level than they need. So, so we're keeping them all healthy. How long does it actually last? You know, here in Quebec, you know, we don't have really, really hot summers, like not like in the South, I guess, California. So, I mean, two weeks for me is no problem here in Quebec. Have, what kind of other testing have you done? How long or what's your recommendation as well? Well, you know, just from a hygiene standpoint, we recommend that people clean their feeders every couple of weeks mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it will last with our testing. It will last, you know, three weeks, even in hot weather, uh -huh. but it, it's, you know, we recommend that instead of, you know, changing every few days, you can change it, you know, once a week isn't bad to change it either. Mm -hmm. It just makes it more convenient for somebody to change it on the weekend yes. versus, you know, if they're working people or if they have a cabin, mm -hmm. if they go up every couple of weeks, you're, you know, you can change it every right. couple of weeks and it's still fine. You know, so that's, uh, we don't want people to keep it in there forever. We want them to clean their feeder. But at the same time, we don't want them to have to change it every two days. I <laughs> so know. It's so that's stressful. The, value of the, product, yeah. <laughs> the other thing that's kind of interesting is as a nutrient, <clears throat> it is only actually absorbed by <clears throat> a animal and the hummingbirds if they need it. In other words, if they don't need the what in there, it just passes through. And so... And it doesn't accumulate. So that's one of the other reasons it's inherently safe is that it's not something that's going to accumulate. It's not something that they even absorb. There are, you know, uh, what you might say, regulators in the intestine that only bring in the nutrient if they need it. And right. It just passes through. And there's a lot of testing. We have a, a very uh, detailed uh review paper talking about all of the different research that's been done in the uh, industry and, and academic uh, uh, universities for showing those things in uh, in birds. Thank you, Dennis. That was very informative. Dennis actually has a few more products that I will talk about later this season. Uh, thank you, Dennis, and uh, have a beautiful summer, and uh, we'll see you later. All right. Thank you very much. Sybil Ham from Quebec is worried about her Norfolk Terrier dog. Recently, an owl moved in into her neighborhood, and that owl is not afraid of Sybil at all. So she's wondering if the owl is actually eyeing her dog. Hi, Sybil. You live in the Mont Tremblant area in Quebec, and you're now blessed with a large owl taking up residence near your home. However, you are also feeling somewhat uncomfortable because the not-so-shy bird has taken more than a casual interest in your Norfolk Terrier. After a phone call conversation, we determined that your owl, without ear tufts, is likely a barred owl and not a great horned owl, the two most common species of large owl in your neck of the woods. Whenever I get such queries, I always think back to that observation someone sent to me years ago of a barred owl swooping down on seizing a live chihuahua from a boardwalk in the Everglades. I can't begin to imagine the horror of its owner watching her prized pet yapping in pain with his leash dangling below, flying off in the clutches of that owl. And great horned owls have also been reported to attack chihuahuas. But I checked out the size and weight of a Norfolk Terrier, and I don't think you have anything to worry about. They weigh about 10 pounds, whereas barred owls weigh less than two pounds and could not lift such heavy prey. It's worth noting too, that owls in general carry their prey away rather than feed on it immediately on the site of a kill. 
here's what I think is likely going on. The owl is breeding in the vicinity and is simply treating your dog like a potential danger to its nest contents. Your concern, though, is not frivolous, if only because we're hearing more and more about bald eagles preying upon cats and small dogs. Some folks in Alaska have actually resorted to installing nets in their backyards to protect their pets from the eagles. And one can go on the internet to buy protective jackets for their pets. Even if a raptor attack on a small pet is not successful, those talons can do some serious damage to both the animals and also to the pocketbook when it comes to vet bills. Every summer since 1995, dedicated and skilled volunteers have headed out to wetlands across Canada to collect data for the Marsh Monitoring Program run by Birds Canada. The goal is to listen and look for birds staging and breeding in wetlands, one of the most endangered habitats in the world. However, many marsh birds, like bitterns, rails and grebes, are notoriously elusive, with some species singing mostly in the dark of night and others becoming immediately silent in the presence of humans. These wetlands must be visited often, sometimes three or four times a day. Moreover, they can be a very dangerous and difficult terrain even during daylight, while other marshlands are quite remote and may even require traversing floating mats of vegetation. To overcome these challenges, Birds Canada biologists are now employing machines called autonomous recording units. Not only can these small units be installed just about everywhere, they can also make stereo recordings at any time of day or night and even over several days or weeks during the breeding season and best of all, peak singing hours. No humans need be present, meaning less intrusion to the birds. Even better, these units can be set up on frozen wetlands and easily retrieved by snowmobiles or snowshoe in the deep snows of winter. To compare these flexible devices with standard techniques involving human observers, Birds Canada staff visited 94 wetlands across Canada and conducted 602 in-person counts while at the same time recording in the field using two different models of the recording unit. Afterwards, the biologists listened to the songs and calls recorded um, that, and they could replay them as often as necessary. The recordings on average gave a very similar result to the in-person counts for most species. Some species with high-pitched songs were better detected on recordings and some species with lower pitch calls were better detected by humans. Birds Canada hastens to add that while these machines are useful, they'll not replace the need for skilled observers doing surveys in real time. I still remember my first encounter with a morning dove. I honestly thought we had an owl in our backyard. Don't you find that their calls resemble those of owls sometimes? <coughs> Well, another confusing thing about uh, morning doves is their name. A lot of people actually misspell it. They write it as M-O-R-N-I-N-G, but it's actually M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Because if you listen to them, it sounds so sad as if they lost someone and now they are mourning them. Another sad thing that I learned about morning doves is that they don't live that long, on average about a year. So basically they live everywhere in the United States and you know some southern parts of Canada and then some populations migrate to the south of Canada to breed. In my backyard I don't normally see them uh, during the winter, they show up sort of early spring around March and then they stay here all summer long with us. Uh, males and females look similar with males a little bit brighter than females. Uh, morning doves are sometimes confused with two other species of doves, Eurasian colored dove and uh, white winged doves. So one of the things that I look for are black spots on wings and their sides because morning doves are the only doves that have those dark spots on their sides. Morning doves are pretty much vegetarians. They love all the grains and the seeds that we offer to other backyard birds. That's why you probably see them under your bird feeders quite often. And even though they're considered ground feeding birds and you know they come to platform and tray feeders, 
Susan Rock here caught one sitting on her Squirrel Solution 150 tube feeder. She was a bit surprised, so was I. And then we posted that picture on social media and apparently she wasn't the only one. So I guess whatever works to get that free seed. Because of their short lifespan, in some areas, morning doves breed all year around, attempting to breed every 30 days, but their official breeding season is from February to October. I don't know if you've seen this, but I see this every year when a male is trying to attract a female. He sits on the branch and then kind of preens himself and flaps his wings and makes these elaborate, beautiful calls. And then when he gets some attention, some of them actually take off off the branch and start flapping their wings as loud as they can trying to attract that female. Males select nesting sites but they don't actually mind reusing old nests. Females uh, build this very simple platform like nest and she actually builds her nest with sticks that a male passes to her as he sits on her back. That cannot be very comfortable. The clutches are normally about two eggs, very small. Uh, they both take turns at incubating the eggs and then chicks fledge when they're about 15 days old, but daddies continue to feed them for another 15 days. Well, I hope you had a chance to browse through all the incredible photos that were submitted to our Reflections Photo Contest. Let's check out the top five. Here's the third place. the second place and the grand prize winner. Congratulations everybody. August is a long month and we have two photo contests. The first one is get your ducks in a row. Well everyone, time to say goodbye. Enjoy feeding and watching hummingbirds. Next episode is N for Northern Cardinals. Take care everyone. I'll talk to you later.